Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Our topic today is titled Meeting the Energy Code Using the Performance Path. My name is Mary Ewer, and I will serve as a moderator for this session. Our speaker, Matt Brown, and I both work for APA, the Engineered Wood Association. APA is a nonprofit trade association representing manufacturers of a variety of common structural engineered wood products. In addition to quality verification and product testing, APA conducts research to improve engineered wood construction systems and educates users and specifiers on the product's proper use and potential applications. Before we start today's webinar, I need to cover some housekeeping details. Matt's presentation will last about 55 minutes. To ensure that everyone can hear it clearly, we've muted all participants. We do encourage you to submit questions by typing them into the questions pane on the control panel on your screen. We should have time to answer most of the questions, but if we run short, we'll be sure to post a Q&A summary on our website along with a recorded version of today's program. We should have that posted in a week or so. I'd also like to note that today's webinar is approved for AIA, ResNet, and ICC continuing education credits. About an hour after the conclusion of the webinar, an email will be sent to each attendee. It will include a link where you can get customized certificates of completion. Our presenter today is Matt Brown. Matt is an engineered wood specialist at APA and located in Indiana. His career in the construction industry began with a production builder overseeing the company's design process and warranty service. Matt then moved into the energy rating industry advising builders on energy code compliance. Matt has also been active in the development of the International Energy Conservation Code and is an ICC Certified Residential Energy Code Inspector and Plans Examiner, a HERS Rater, and a Certified Green Professional. Matt combines his structural background with his energy conservation expertise for APA by assisting builders and designers in cost-effectively meeting both the structural and energy efficiency requirements of the code that are necessary in satisfying the demands of today's savvy home buyers and building owners. For those of you just joining us, welcome to APA's webinar on the topic of meeting the energy code using the performance path. I will now turn the microphone over to our speaker, Matt Brown. Thank you, Mary. And as you mentioned, today's webinar is going to be based on performance-based energy code compliance. First of all, we'd like to remind everybody that the class is approved for AIA Continuing Education Learning Units. The course description is set forth in AIA. And our objectives for today, um, our learning objectives for the credits are gonna be, one, we wanna develop an understanding of the IECC pathways for compliance. We wanna understand the advantages of performance-based energy code compliance. We wanna understand component and material effects and the ERI compliance method. And we want to understand simulated performance compliance and the projected exterior wall assemblies that you can use for each climate zone that we'll dig into a little bit later in the presentation. So for today's agenda, first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with defining the code pathways. We have to have a basic understanding of the code, the different pathways you can use and how to utilize them. We're going to introduce APA's performance-based energy code compliance publication. And then we're going to break into that publication and we're going to go into the ERI compliance path as well as the simulated performance path as well. So first we're starting off with, of course, defining the different pathways. And the first one we're going to start with is looking at the four different paths that you can use within the energy code. The first one is a prescriptive table R value approach. And basically it's just a set table of our values for the walls, floors, ceilings, and U factors for glass um, that you would utilize in the code. The next one is the U factor and UA alternatives pathway. And the U factor is very similar to the R value table. It's just the R values are inverse to give you the U factor. And the total UA alternative is a method where you can assign the entire house an overall U factor. And then you can have flexibility in design as long as your designed U factor is lower than or equal to the code built home. Both of those are prescriptive pathways by code definition, and they have to comply with any section labeled mandatory as well as any section labeled prescriptive within the code. Simulated performance is one of the two different performance pathways that you can utilize in the code. 
and it's been in there a while, it's well used in many locations and markets. The ERI, or Energy Rating Index approach, is the newest code pathway put in the code in the 2015 IECC. Both of those pathways, both performance pathways, as well as the prescriptive pathways, all have to comply with any section labeled mandatory in the code. So this is the 2015 IECC prescriptive R value table. And you can see that it's kind of like a table book for each climate zone where you can go down and look at each component of the wall, floor, ceiling, as well as skylight, window, U factors, and solar heat gain coefficients where required. And it'll give you the values of different items that you have to build your home to. Probably of most interest, and in one of the areas that builders tell us is their biggest impact, is the above grade wood frame wall R values. And you can see from climate zones three and above, you pretty much have a minimum of an R20 or an R20 plus five, or a 13 plus five. Whenever you see a 13 plus uh, a value, the plus value there that you have at the end, say the five, is that's continuous insulation by code. So you'd have a 13 in the cavity and an R5 continuous insulation. Some of the positives of the prescriptive path is it's simple and easy to enforce. It's basically a recipe for how you build the building thermal envelope. It's also the most recognized by architects, engineers, and code officials. And it goes back to because it is a simple recipe. You can flip open the code book. You can see what you're supposed to have in each wall, floor, or ceiling area. And it gives you a recipe for design. Some of the negatives of the prescriptive path are, though, that there's very few trade-offs allowed per code. So you pretty much have to stick with those values. You don't get a lot of flexibility in design. You don't get a lot of flexibility within the system. It has a higher cost to build. Um, there are some studies out there that show from uh, many sources, one of the most common ones from Leading Builders of America, that shows that you can have a cost as much as $1,700 more per home for the prescriptive path versus a home built to the simulated performance path. And some of the items within the prescriptive path our value table have a poor return of investment. There are items within the table as well as within the path and requirements that may have over 100 year payback periods. Um, so they simply have a poor return of the investment that you put into them. And it's very restrictive. And that kind of goes back to the few trade-offs. It doesn't give you a lot of flexibility. It's pretty strict as far as how you have to build the house and the components that go into it. The UA trade-off approach, though, in, in the U-factor table, just to touch on that for a minute, the U-factor table is pretty much the same as the R-value table. It's just the inverse of the R-value is how you come up with the U-factor. But it does give you a little bit of flexibility in design. Not to be confused with the UA trade-off approach, and it's often dubbed the ResCheck approach in code because ResCheck is probably the most commonly used software for it. The total UA works by basically assigning a total U value to the home of all the wall, floor, and ceiling components built to that R value or U value table within the code. And then that's called a U of O. And then you have flexibility in the building envelope in your design as long as your U of O is equal to or less than a code built home. So it gives you some flexibility within the system. It's a free software from the US Department of Energy. So you can download and use ResCheck for free. No special training is required to actually run the software, though I do recommend taking the online tutorial courses and following some of the forums to see common mistakes because there are a lot of different little mistakes that can come up whenever you're running these. And it allows for R value to R value trades. So it's a very limited trades, but in what we mean by that is if you're gonna take some R value out of the walls per se, you might make it up by putting more R value in your ceiling or slab floor insulation or basement insulation or better U factor in your windows or doors. So it allows for trades, but only trades within the building thermal envelope. And they may no longer make state specific versions of the software. What's happened is the codes have moved up in efficiency very quickly. States often amend those codes. So they have specific requirements for each state. Um, and the US Department of Energy has been updating ResCheck to follow that, but it really depends on if they have funds, ability, and staff to be able to continue to do that as states update their codes. Here's an example of the UA compliance. You can see over here on the left-hand portion of your screen, 
is an actual compliance document. This is actually run in REM design software. And you can see that it has the 2015 IACC base home built to the code requirements in the U of O assigned to it, 994.4. And then it's been designed with different wall, floor, and ceiling components, but its U of O is 444.3, 444.3. So it's lower than or equal to. All the mandatory requirements are met within the code, so it's in compliance with the code. So it gives you some flexibility. Um, but it's still, again, it's just a building thermal envelope trade. And just a note, all mandatory items still have to be met in any sections that are marked prescriptive, which really come into effect in the mechanical section of the energy code, still have to be in compliance with the UA trade-off approach as well. Some positives are the builder can run the program. So, they don't have to go to an outside source. They can have their in-house designers or in-house staff run the program. And it does allow some trade-offs within the code. A perfect example of that is the code requires an R20. What if I want to put in a two by six wall with an R19 bat that's compressed so it gets an R18? That would be a perfect use for a U-factor UA trade-off approach. Negatives are, it's our value for our value trades only. So you have to take from one area of the building thermal envelope and make it up in another area of the thermal envelope. <clears throat> a good infiltration rates are not credited, uh, as well as good duct leakage rates are not credited in there, so you don't get any credits for good test results. It has a moderate cost, and we put that as a negative because it's probably not quite as expensive as the pres prescriptive pass straight up our value table, um, but it's still going to probably cost more than your simulated performance or your RI pathways. And again, just to kind of reiterate, you still have to meet all the mechanical provisions of R403 that have such sections that are labeled prescriptive specifically. Simulated performance approach, um, that's probably the code pathway that gives you the most flexibility. It's not probably, it does allow the most flexibility within the code, basically because it has no backstop to it. And uh, what I mean by backstop is, is, is we'll learn here in a little bit when we talk about the RI path, the envelope can't be any less than the 2009 R value table um, for the ERI path. The simulated performance path has no backstop to it. So you essentially could have, I mean, if you could design it, you could have a house without insulation in one area as long as it were made up in the other parts of the home and it would be in compliance still. Nobody really does that, but the simple fact of the matter is it has no backstops that prevent something like that. But it does credit tight infiltration rate and tight duct leakage as well. So the better you test, the more credit you can take for that. And here are three different approved softwares by the U.S. Department of Energy. You have REM rate and REM design, Ecotrope, and Energy Gauge. Ecotrope and REM, the REM products are probably going to be the most commonly used in the market. Um, Energy Gauge is used a lot in the state of Florida, but it can be used anywhere as well. And this is an example of a performance-based compliance certificate. This was ran in REM design as well. And you can see, I like these certificates, especially the ones that have things that move liability, so make sure you have a copy of it on hand. You'll note here, right under the first gray box, it says the organization below certifies that the proposed building and plans is consistent with, you know, everything that they need for that climate zone. And basically, that organization takes the liability for that home having met the code. And anytime you have a document that moves liability, it's good to have a copy as the builder, code official, and the rater as well, or a person that's actually doing the testing, or if they've offered a you know energy consultant, something like that. The nice thing about the certificates is they are very specific. They're address specific, site specific. So you'll notice a, an address, a city, a state, the name of the builder that built it, the code that it met, and it'll have all the different components in the walls, floor, and ceiling, which are really nice. It's nice to have that information because it kind of lives with the house is what was delivered at the time that it was put together. It'll also have the test results for both infiltration and duct leakage and the type of equipment that's in it, even though the equipment itself doesn't factor into the efficiency and the simulated performance path. And I always like to note that all mandatory requirements still have to be met within the pathway. Some positives to the performance path is it allows a lot of flexibility in building design. It allows the most out of any pathway in the code. It does credit low infiltration rate, tight ductwork. 
it has a lower cost compared to the prescriptive path. Like I said, there's a couple studies out there. Um, some of them show as much as $1,700 difference between the simulated performance and the prescriptive path. So it's important to, to take cost, uh, cost into account as well. Some of the negatives are builders and code officials are not often as familiar with the pathway. Um, you know, when the path first started being used a whole lot in 2009, there's a lot of education that had to go out to jurisdictions because they had builders that were turning in an R20 wall assembly, let's say in climate zone five, and then they had a performance builder next to him that was turning in one with an R13 or an R15 wall, and it said it complied as well. So it shot up red flags, and, and really it was just an education of how the performance path works. The code official may require third-party infiltration testing, so it's important to know that the code official, you know, the testing has to be done in the code, um, but they can actually require that to be done by a third party independent from the builder or the installer of insulation as well. And it does not credit efficient equipment or hot water heating equipment. So HVAC equipment, hot water heating equipment, even if you buy some of the best stuff on the market, you're not going to get any credit for it in the performance pathway itself. The 2015 IACC ERI path method, though, is a little bit different. And ERI, whenever we say that, it means energy rating index. And, and what that is, is the ERI is based on a standard new home of 100 on the index. And that's basically a home built to the 2006 IECC. Each point on the index then represents 1% of energy. So the lower, the better, the higher, the more inefficient it is. So you want to be lower on the index with 100 as the standard of it. There are a few little things that have to be met. Uh, it does have a backstop. The envelope has to meet the R value table of the 2009 IECC, but it does allow for credit for advanced HVAC systems, high efficient hot water systems, lighting, stuff like that can actually be taken into consideration as well. And over here, you can see the different ERI index numbers that are required for the different codes that are being used. In the 2015, uh, you can see like climate zone three had to have a 51. And in the 2018, you have to have a 57. So you actually get seven points higher that you can go in the 2018. And, and that was done because it was felt in the 2015 that the ERI path, you know, it wasn't felt, but it actually had a percentage of about five to 6% more efficient than a home built to the prescriptive path. So the 2018 was to try to align that a little bit better so that the efficiencies are a little bit closer to one another for the three different pathways. So you're allowed to go up to 57 in the 2018, and basically three, four, and five, you got about a six point gain that you could go with um, that can really help you out as a builder and, and allow this pathway to be viable. Some positives are it allows flexibility in building design and it credits low infiltration rates and tight duct work. So you're gonna get credit there similar to what you would in the simulated performance path. It has a lower cost compared to the prescriptive path. And again, that'll probably vary a little bit depending on the climate zone and what that backstop does to you. But it does credit high efficiency equipment, both water heating, HVAC, and lighting equipment. Some negatives are builders and code officials are not often as familiar with it. And this is really because it's, it's new. It was just put in in the 2015. So there's a lot of questions about it. It does require energy modeling to be completed. And again, the code official may require a third party for the testing. So, you know, it's pretty clear that everything has to be tested. They can actually require the entity that does that to be a third party independent, again, from the builder or the installer of the air sealing measures. So it's important to have a conversation with your code official to see what their requirements are going to be. And how performance in ERI really work, and, and I'm going to put this in kind of perspective first to the simulated performance and then jump in on how it works in ERI. But basically you have a standard reference home and that's what you have up here in the right hand side of the screen is the standard reference design. And that's a home built to the U factor R value table in the 2015 IECC. You have your proposed design, how you want to build it with the features that you want to put in it. It uses an energy estimation tool that all uses a DOE2 calculation procedure and you have to prove for simulated performance that your proposed design has equal to or less than energy cost than the standard reference home. So you have to have equal energy costs per year on an annual basis or less than in your compliance with the code. 
on the URI side of this, it does the same thing. It builds a standard reference design. You have your proposed design, but it's going to decide. It's going to assign it a numeric value. That's just a point, you know, point value like 51, and you have to make sure that that meets. It's equal to or less than that on the index for the climate zone that's required. <clears throat> so before we move into the next section, I want to pass it off to Mary to see if we've got any questions on what we've taught so far. We have had a couple questions come in. Thank you, Matt. The first one is actually, I will answer it on my own. Um, we've had some questions come in about downloading of slides. At this point, the slides aren't available for download, but as I mentioned, we will post a recording of this webinar on our website in about a week, so you'll be able to review the information that way. Um, other questions that we've had come in. One of them is, if the performance path requires testing after the building is constructed, what happens if the test fails? Good question, Mary. Well, the Performance path in itself has a mandatory requirement, or all paths actually have a mandatory requirement of three air changes an hour, um, and that's not tradable. Though there have been proposals at both the last national code hearings and several states that would allow that leakage rate to be tradable above three in the performance pathways as long as you make up the energy loss in the energy modeling itself. Uh, but currently, you know, the best thing is is to work with the person that's actually going to be testing the home, make sure that you know they're doing their drywall pre-drywall inspections, insulation inspections, and they'll be doing the final test out and they can help coach and make sure that you don't have those end failures that you need to be concerned about or you lessen the, the chance of that actually happening in the field. Um, and that's the best way to really go about it. But I wouldn't be surprised if in the future that we see uh, allowances in code that allow you to go above that mandatory threshold as long as the energy loss is made up in the model somewhere. Wonderful, thank you. Along a similar line, in the simulated performance path, can a builder conduct or provide the energy modeling? That's a great one. Um, technically, the builder can provide the energy modeling. However, they cannot provide the required testing. The testing has to be done by a third party entity. Um, so they can provide the modeling. They can get the tested numbers from you know, the testing company and insert them into the model but they can't physically do the, mo the testing themselves uh, is the same entity. Okay, that's great. And then the final one for this break is, I, the prescriptive climate zone three wood framed walls require an R20 or an R13 plus five. Does that mean that an R19 fiberglass bat with added to the value, R values for the sheathings, the air films and the drywall gets you to that R20? That's a great question, Mary. And, you know, no, technically it doesn't because our value computation, which is in section 402.1.3, prohibits summing the different building components in the R value approach. You can sum the different components in the U factor, UA trade off, and any of the performance based methods, but you cannot do that in the prescriptive R value table approach. It doesn't give you that flexibility. Um, so that's that in that case, you would have to flip over to either the U factor UA trade off approach. Um, the UA trade off, again, dubbed the res check approach, um, that would very easily in most cases allow an R19 or an R18 compressed insulation bat to satisfy the requirement for an R20 by just making it up somewhere else in the model with a pretty small measure. Wonderful, thank you. Okay. Let's go back to learning more about these paths. Thank you, Mary. And moving forward, we're going to jump into introducing APA's performance-based energy compliance publication. And really what this is intended to be, it's intended to be a guide to generate conversations between your energy consultants or your rater. And when I say rater, I mean is a general term. You know, that could be a HERS rater, it could be a BPI rater, it could be really any energy professional that does the testing as well. It's really meant to be a tool that generates conversations between that energy professional and the builder. All, all houses have to be modeled specifically for their address, their climate space, the type of house. Um, so while there's some good information in here, it's important that you know that all homes still have to be modeled. This is just meant to be a guide. 
In the performance pathways themselves, what they really look at is treating the house as a system. So both simulated performance and the ERI are trying to look at the house as a system. Though you don't get credit for everything in simulated performance, you do get effects of the house as a whole that you can take credit for within that. And that's really how we understand home energy efficiency is by looking at the house as a whole. Uh, the prescriptive path looks at everything in kind of a compartmentalized or component approach where the performance pathways look at how everything's interacting with one another, even what orientation it faces and how big the overhangs are, stuff like that is taken into considerations as well. So it's important that we understand the modeling basis as well, because there's tons of different modeling scenarios out there. And what we wanted to do was use something that was consistent and rational, that would provide something that could be used over and over again. So we use the DOE prototype home, that's US Department of Energy prototype home for single family, uh, single family home for determining the cost effectiveness of the 2015 IECC. This gives us a consistent rational basis for the energy modeling. And basically that house is a 3,400 square foot two story on a basement in climate zones uh, four and above, and it's on a slab in climate zones three and below. And you know, that gives it a consistent basis that we're going back to. We're not changing the model with each individual climate zone or anything like that. It's consistent. Everything goes off the same model. It's got apples to apples comparison, if you say. And the assembly reference models use the 2015 U-factor table. So whenever we talk about what it's comparing against, it's always using the 2015 IECC as a reference. And all the calculations for the component U-values are in accordance with the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals 2015. So next we're going to jump into the ERI compliance path you know, within what we cover within our publication. And the first part we're going to talk about is wall assemblies. We're going to talk about advanced framing, how the R value can affect the individual wall analysis, and what continuous insulation does to our walls as well. First, we got to define our version of advanced framing because you can, if you just search online, you'll see advanced framing anywhere from probably 11% framing factor up to 23% framing factor. And APA uses a, a model where ours is 18% framing factor. And we'll talk about some of the specifics of that in a minute. One of the things that we want to look at is, and this is just to give kind of an optical view of what you're going to see. You can see in the yellow, this is a two by four, 16 inch on center framed. And in the overlay of the brown or the stripe, you can see that's a two by six, 24 inch on center with ladder blocking at wall intersections, a single ply header type scenarios. And it's meant to you know, reduce the amount of thermal bridging that you may get from those studs within the wall system. So the first thing we want to talk about is a three stud corner or an insulatable corner. And you can get to an insulatable corner using the three stud corner or California corner method. Uh, the nice thing is it allows for insulation to go back behind it, but still provides nailing surfaces for the drywall in the corner. In a traditional corner, you can see that we have the same amount of studs. This is a traditional three stud corner, but we have this inch and a half space that's really hard to get insulated back there. Um, and as much as people try or say they insulated it, my experience in the field is whenever you actually investigate it, you find out it was never actually insulated. Ladder blocking wall intersections. So this is a way that you can provide more insulatable area, reduce thermal bridging because you don't have a framing member going from the interior to the exterior of the wall. You want to put the blocking install the face wise towards you. You want it to be vertical up and down so you get a good nailing surface. Um, but it also allows that bat to just be notched or that insulation to be notched around it on the back side without it going the full depth of the framing member. And that helps reduce the thermal bridging of the wall assembly as well. And these are great concepts for ways that you can improve energy efficiency by just changing the way we frame a little bit. Single ply headers um, at the top plate. You know, you can see here, we still have our double top plate, but we have a single ply header in here that allows for more insulation to be installed. Um, you know, I like to fall back on that, you know, the IRC itself allows most openings in a single story building, four foot wide or less, to be a single member, um, which is important. We go into a lot of homes 
where we see double member double ply members everywhere and um, they really aren't needed all the time there so sometimes it's just we're builders we're creatures of habit so we continue to do it uh, where we could get by with a single ply member have more insulatable area um, you know so that we can get more energy efficiency out of the wall system as well and a few things i like to always talk about with the advanced framing is the structural integrity side of it because it's something that we get asked a lot and apa has actually looked at that within our lab and you know the first thing is stacked framing provides a direct load path so if you have a fully stacked system um, from the truss all the way down through the framing it provides a direct load path which increases structural integrity the other thing that we like to talk about is two by six studs 24 inches on center are two and a half times stiffer in a moment comparison then two by four stud walls at 16 inches on center. So, you know, that two by six, 24 on center, we get two and a half times stiffer in moment than what we have with a two by four wall uh, with studs that are 16 inches on center. So you get some more strength out of that wall as well, which is really important because we've heard a lot of that when advanced framing hits the builders. Sometimes the builders say, well, you know, what do we have to be concerned about as far as drywall or siding or exterior sheathing and, and all of those items work with advanced framing. So when we get down to it, we start looking at, well, what does it save me in energy? And we looked at two different wall assemblies, two different R-value wall assemblies within our analysis. <clears throat> the first one was an R18, which is basically a two by six wall with an R19 bat that's compressed. Because we all know that the R19 on the manufacturer's label says it's a 19 and a six and a quarter inch cavity. We only have a five and a half inch cavity. So when you compress that, it's an R18. But if we look at, say, climate zone three, we can see that it saves us one point or 1% in energy. And when we look at the R20 wall, and this is an actual R20, so it can either be a blown product or they do make an R20 bat product out there now as well. And it also saves us one point or 1% of energy. And these are the same, even though the insulated value changes simply because of the way the ERI system rounds. You know, this, this one that we have for the 18 might be a 1.4 percent so it rounds it down to one um, you know where this one might be a, a 1.4 or one percent and it's going to round it to one as well so the reason why these are the same is because the system does round based on the energy efficiency of the total assembly so you don't get credit i mean you get credit for it you get the one point but sometimes it looks strange in optics because you're still getting one point for both insulated values and it's simply because of the way the system rounds and it's always good to keep in mind that our system assumed an 18 percent framing factor with double top plates and an r12 insulated headers as well and over here in the picture this is actually a picture i took with a builder i worked with uh, back in my energy rating days that they switched to advanced framing they kept their double top plate so that their floor framing or roof framing didn't necessarily have to be fully in line uh, that's the advantage of keeping the double top plate is that you can have this framing member above fall anywhere within here and it can carry that if it's a single top plate you have a one inch to one inch center between the roof rafter ceiling joist and the wall stud so it doesn't have a lot of flexibility uh, the double ply headers or the double Top plates also work well with pre-cut lumber because if you have a single top plate, you have to have lumber specifically cut for a single top plate uh, where pre-cut studs work fine with a double top plate. Wall insulation. So we wanted to look at how different insulation values affect the walls based from what the code basis is for that wall value. And I'll pick on a, we'll look at climate zone three here, for instance. So climate zone three, if they do an R13 two by four wall, where an R20 or 13 plus five is required, it's gonna cost them 3% in energy. So they have three points basically that they're losing because they went with an R13 wall instead of the R20 that's prescribed by code. The R15, very similar. You can see it's gonna cost you two points or 2% in energy. You know, and then when you get up into climate zone five, you can see that the 15 is going to cost you 3%. And we have no recommendation on doing an R13 wall in climate zone five. And it's important also that we understand that an R value is an R value. So that R value is whether it be made up of any blown products, blown fiberglass, blown cellulose, blankets, bats, or rolls, or it be spray foam. 
This analysis simply looked at the R value differences in those assemblies, not some of the other things that may come into effect, such as reduced air leakage and stuff like that. It's looking at the R value value only. Continuous insulation are oftentimes called CI out in the field as well. We wanted to look at what those values are. What does thermal bridging actually cost us with the wood studs in a, a typical home? Um, and what do you gain by having the continuous insulation on the outside of it? So in this case, um, you can see here, and, and it's good. What I want to do is actually define what we did in this analysis. So what we did in this analysis was we simply traded out the exterior wall sheathing of wood structural panel, which could be OSB or plywood. And we traded that out to either an R3 or an R5 in the analysis. But it's important as the pictures show down here too, to know that we have to balance structure and energy. So these photos show how it would typically be done in the field with your wood structural panel intermittent bracing methods required those structural panels at the corners and inset in the wall line and how the foam would typically infill that for the continuous insulation would infill that. So let's look at climate zone three again. So if we do an R3 continuous insulation in climate zone three, it saves us about one point or 1% 1 of energy. Uh, R5 continuous in those climate zone in climate zone three would save us about 2%. And when we start looking at climate zone five, we get a little more value out of it, which makes sense because it's more of a heating dominated climate zone. So the more we do in the upper climate zones that are more heating dominated in walls, um, you're gonna save a little bit more energy with it. And you can see that you save two points or 2% 2 um, for the R3 continuous in climate zone five, and you're gonna save three points or 3% 3 uh, for the continuous insulation value of R5. Roof systems. So we wanted to look at radiant barriers, deeply buried ducts, and ducts in condition space. The deeply buried ducts and ducts considered in condition space are new to the 2018 uh, IECC Energy International Energy Conservation Code. Though there's nothing that prevents them from being done this way in the 2015, it's something you should have a conversation with your code official about if you want to utilize those two sections in the 2015 to make sure that they are cool with it or it's good to go with them. So radiant barrier roofs, that's the first thing we wanted to look at. And these are pretty common in the southern United States. We see a lot of radiant barrier used down there. It's a cooling dominated climate zone. We have a lot of duct work in the attic because we have a lot of slab foundations. And we can see like in climate zone three, which would encompass markets like Dallas and Atlanta, that's going to save you about three points or 3% in energy there. And as you'd expect, it falls off as we get into the northern climate zones because they're more heating dominated climate zones and we have less duct work typically in the attic in those areas as well. Deeply buried ducts. So this again is new to the 2018 IRC or IECC. Um, and you can see that there are specific requirements that have to be met whenever you're going to take credit for deeply buried ducts. But the next, two, the next two pieces we're going to talk about are specific to performance-based homes only. You don't get these credits in the prescriptive path at all. And basically what it does, it allows when you're using simulated energy performance analysis, either simulated energy performance or the ERI, to have an effective duct insulation value of an R25. So we can model it in an R25, provided we meet these conditions. The first one is the duct here. The yellow wrap around it is an R8, so you have an R8 ductwork. You have five and a half inches of insulation below the duct. So basically, you, you would set that duct on the bottom cord of a two, you know, of a truss. So you'd have a two by six in the bottom cord. Um, you would actually set that duct right on top of it, and have a five and a half inches minimum of insulation below it, or maximum, excuse me, below it. You're going to have a minimum of three and a half inches of insulation above it and you're gonna have a minimum of an R30 insulation on either side of it. Provided that you've met those conditions, you can actually take credit for those ducts and model it at an R25. Prior to this, because the code didn't specifically allow it, we had to model it as only an R8. You didn't get credit for the insulation that was blown over it. So you're going for basically an R8 in the energy model, what we used to be able to do, to an R25. And you can see like in climate zone three, it's gonna save you two points or 2% of energy. And in climate zone five, you're still gonna get one point or 1% of energy. Uh, so you have savings across the board, but it's you get more savings with it in cooling dominated climate zones than you do heating dominated climate zones. 
ducks in conditioned space is a little bit different. So it's it's kind of taking the deeply buried and adding some more things to it. So then we could call those ducks in conditioned space in the energy modeling software. Uh, the advantage of it is, is you can get some really good energy savings. You can see up here in climate zone three, you could get as much as seven points or 7%. In climate zone five, you can get seven points or 7% as well. Climate zone four is kind of the anomaly because you get six, but that's because you get the greatest value out of ducks in condition space in cooling dominated or heating dominated when you're kind of in the middle, it's slightly less value for it. But there's a lot of things you have to do to be in compliance with this as well. So the first one is the air handler has to be located inside conditioned space. It can't be just exposed in the attic. You have to have a duct leakage rate that's within a prescribed limit that's more stringent than the standard duct leakage rate. Uh, you have to be at one and a half CFM per 100 square foot of floor area total, um, where the code would normally allow you to go up to four CFM per 100 square foot total. So you have, you know, one and a half to four, it's, it's a much tighter duct system. Um, and you have to have insulation above the duct and around the duct that's equal to the minimum insulation that's required for that attic or that you're putting in that attic. So if you're putting a 38 in, you got to have a 38 above it. If you're putting a 49 in, you got to have a 49 above it as well. So you have to do a little bit more to get there, but the energy savings speak for themselves because there's good energy savings gains that can be had there. This will probably be quite popular in the northern United States for the houses that do have attic ductwork, um, simply because we typically already hold our ducts down to right above the ceiling joist or bottom quarter of the truss. Um, we already typically blow over our ductwork, so it's just making sure we have the R8 and we go to a tighter duct leakage. And a lot of our air handlers in the north are already in a basement or conditioned space, so we don't typically put them in the attic. So a um, lot of advantages that can be had there, but again, uh, you got to make sure you meet all the additional requirements too. Lighting and equipment. So everything that we've talked about so far, you can actually take credit for both in the simulated performance path and the ERI path. As we get into lighting and equipment, these are ERI path only. So you can only get credit for these items in the ERI path. And some things we're going to look at is high efficacy lighting, 95% AFUE furnaces, 18 sear air conditioning. So high efficacy lighting, again, this is specific to the ERI path only. You can get as much as, we'll say, climate zone three. Again, this is markets like Dallas and Atlanta. You can get four points or 4% saving. Even in climate zone five, you can get 3% savings. So you get decent savings across the board. And it's important that you understand how we modeled this as well. The code requires a minimum 75% high efficacy lights. Um, this is simply that additional 25%. So between the 75% and the 100%, the additional 25% of making all of your bulbs in your house high efficacy, that's what these numbers represent. So it's only 25% of the total bulbs because the code already requires the other 75%. Um, and again, it's one of the unique factors here that you see is in climate zone five, you notice that as you get in northern climate zones are more heating dominated, the value of them actually decrease slightly. And that's simply because incandescent bulbs give off heat and it actually reduces your heating load. So in a heating dominated climate zone, uh, you're gonna get a little less value for them than you would in a cooling dominated climate zone. So it's kind of an interesting anomaly that happens there. 95% AFUE furnaces, 95% efficient. And again, it's important that we remember that the federal minimum is still an 80% furnace. So this is modeling it against the federal minimum. We know that some markets already have commonly 90 or 95 or 90 or 92% furnaces, um, but the federal minimum is still an 80. So someone can still put an 80 in and there are some markets where it's still standard to have an 80% furnace. So we're modeling against an 80% furnace to a 95% furnace in this scenario. And you can see even in uh, cooling dominated climates like Dallas and Atlanta and climate zone three, you're still going to save 4% in energy. As you get into the cooling dominated climate zones, you can see that the efficiency really starts to kick in. Um, you know, if you're in climate zone five or six, where, you know, again, an 80 is the minimum and you're putting a 95% furnace in compared to that, you can save eight, even as much as 10% of energy um, simply by upgrading that furnace. And it's usually a fairly cost effective upgrade as well. Air conditioning. 
air conditioning is a little unique because the federal minimum uh, SEER rating actually changes depending on climate zone a little bit. So in climate zone three, for instance, you have a minimum already of a 14 SEER error. Uh, so going up to an 18 SEER is going to give you four points or 4% in energy. And climate zone five, for instance, our minimum SEER rating is a 13. So going from a 13 to an 18, I, I only get one point still. But that's still 1% of energy savings there by upgrading my air conditioning unit as well. And here's how we really look at the table, and, and we want people to use the table. So this is kind of a summary of the whole table, too, that's in the pathway or in the publication. And this is how you can utilize the table. And this is the purpose of why we put it there is, uh, let's say Dallas, Texas, climate zone three. The minimum code requirement for walls are R20 or 13 plus five. That market commonly does a two by four R13 wall. And that's gonna cost them three points or 3% in energy right there. It's gonna make it less efficient basically compared to what's required by the code. But they also commonly install radiant barrier roof sheathing, which saves three points. So it actually washes out the effects pretty much of the R13. So it gives you an immediate trade-off by two items that they're already currently doing in the market. Um, but let's say, you know, as a builder, you wanted to look at what it's going to, what you'd say by putting an R5 continuous or an R3 continuous. That's the beauty of the table. It gives you the flexibility to look at what some of those items are and what it's going to cost you in energy, um, you know, and and what you could save in energy as well. Um, but again, this is based on the DOE base home. Every home has to be ran for their own specific HERS and ERI numbers. Um, and in simulated performance, the same thing. You have to specifically run the house against the reference model to actually get the full value of it. But this can generate conversations and it gives you a starting point for those conversations of, oh, you know, I might be able to do advanced framing and save 1% and maybe I can save an additional 2% by doing the radiant barrier sheathing. So it gives you some flexibility and it gives you some knowledge going into the into the modeling and consulting to look at what is important to you as a builder or an energy rater. The next thing we're going to talk about is the simulated performance path. So as we talked about previously, the ERI compliance path, you know, some of those items you can take credit for in simulated performance, but specifically, we're going to be looking at the simulated performance path and assemblies that work within them. So and how you can utilize those. And again, it uses the same basic model. You have a proposed design, how the builder wants to build the house versus a standard reference design, which is how the code would be built to the U-factor table in the code. You use an energy estimation tool. Again, they all go to DOE calculation procedure. And you have to prove that your home uses less energy or equal energy than the code built home and you're in compliance with the code. So in climate zone three, for instance, and this would be markets like Dallas, Texas, and Atlanta, Georgia, as I've stated before, um, this allows for you to keep those two by four frame walls with an R13 insulation. They can do an R38 attic insulation. Uh, slab insulation, again, isn't required. In the 2015 here, you can see I broke it down between 2015 and 2018. You'd have to have a 0.32 window. And in the 2018, you'd have to go to 0.30. So you would have to do a slightly better window, but the code changed there as well. Air change in hours three because it's mandatory. So you're going to have that value in both of them. R8 ductwork, and they both have radiant barrier sheathing uh, or radiant barriers in the attic. Climate zone four also permits a two by four wall assembly to be used. Uh, R13 as well. In the 15, you can see that you can do an R38 attic, or in the 18, you'd have to do a 49. R10 foundation insulation. Again, that slightly better window in the 2018. Three air changes an hour because it's mandatory. R8 ducts and radiant barrier sheathing as well. Climate zone five. Again, you can do an R15 wall, two by four wall um, with an R49 attic. In the 2015, you'd have to do an R19 foundation insulation, but in the 2018, you can do an R10. And that's because in the 2018, I took credit for the condition duct. Um, you know, if you didn't take credit for that, you'd have to look at a different foundation insulation. But that's the kind of advantages you can get by doing the condition ducts is 
trading down fi uh, foundation insulation or looking at different wall values and stuff like that as well. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in the building design. And of course, no radiant barriers were considered in those climate zones because they're just not as much value for them up there. And in climate zone six, one of the nice things about this one is it allows for a two by six R21 wall without CI. The code base wall here is a 20 plus five. Um, so you'd have a, an R20 in the cavity plus an R5 continuous insulation. And this in the performance model allows you to do just an R21 high density bad or blown insulation. R19 foundation walls. Again, you get that R49 attic. Uh, the 0.32 windows in the 2015 and 0.30 windows in the 2018. It does utilize the deeply buried duct um, pathway in the 2018. But again, it allows for you to do that R21 2x6 wall, which is really advantageous for builders. And here's what all the different climate zones look like in the two different codes. And again, these are these are models that would have to be ran for the individual house at its site, address, and orientation. But it gives you a starting point of the conversation of what you might be able to do in the 2015 and 2018 for the simulated performance. And it looks at climate zones 2 to 7 and the 2015 to 2018 code and what assemblies would look like in each of them. So it, it uh, gives you a rough idea of what you can do and the flexibility that can be had there as well as the energy savings. So today we wanted to look at the different energy code pathways. We wanted to define them so people would understand and understand the concepts behind them. We wanted to introduce APA's performance-based energy code compliance publication and we wanted to show you the differences in ERI compliance path within our publication in table two, and talk about simulated performance assemblies and what you can do to provide flexibility utilizing simulated performance. Um, and with that, we'll hand it back over to Mary to see if we have any other questions that have come in. Thank you. All Thank right, you, Mary. Matt. That was excellent. Um, we did have quite a few questions come in. We'll get through as many as we can in the next couple of minutes here. As a reminder, those that we do not answer will be posted with the recording of this webinar on our website in about a week. Um, first question, Matt, can you use a high performance bat to meet our 20 insulation requirements? Yeah, I mean, there are high performance, R20 bats are technically a high performance bat as well. And R21 is a high density, high performance bat. Um, both are available in the market. And, uh, you know, they, of course, have cost differences from a, a 19 to the 20 and 21, um, but they can certainly be used to meet the requirements prescriptively. Perfect. Thank you. And when we, you were talking about advanced framing, you talked a little bit about California corners, which allows those corners to be insulated. What happens when you need more studs at a shear wall for the structural aspects there? That's a great question. And, and we get that a lot. And with a, a structural background energy question, we always have this common tug of war per se between structure and energy. So I like to hit on that. But, um, you know, basically where we need something structurally, the structural has to override what we need for energy. We can try to, and, and the code's very clear on that in some areas, especially when you get to headers, it tells you if you need a full, um, you know, full width framing for the header, then you don't insulate it because you, you're not able to. Um, we want to get as much insulation as we can in there to balance the structure and the energy. But when it comes down to it, we have to make sure that we've met our structural requirements before we go back and insulate it. Wonderful. Um, we've had a couple of questions about attics and when they're considered conditioned. Um, so I'm going to throw these both at you and then let you, let you answer them at the same time. It, in an unvented attic, if the insulation is right at the underside of the roof deck, are those ducts considered in condition space? And then also, if it's a traditional attic, but there's a mechanical closet built in and that is connected to that condition space, does it need to be insulated to the exterior wall R values? Great questions. Totally separate. So I'll start with the first one. So if we insulate the underside of the roof deck, by definition, those ducts within that space then become conditioned. Um, and then some, you know, the commercial code calls it semi-conditioned, but the residential code calls it conditioned space whenever we do that, because we've moved the building thermal envelope from the ceiling level to the bottom of the roof deck. So then by definition, they become in conditioned space. Um, whenever we take 
a room and we put it in the attic or we have a wall between an attic and say a vaulted ceiling consideration, those walls by definition have to meet the exterior wall requirements of the code or be modeled, you know, they're put in the energy model and have to meet whatever those guidelines are for whatever, you know, the model tells you you need to have there. Um, they can't be left uninsulated if we're going to call it a conditioned room within the attic. Um, we have people that have built the rooms, put the equipment in there, but don't put any insulation. It's still an attic equipment access room. Um, it's not conditioned. Whenever you insulate it, put air barriers on it, you're sealed in accordance with the code, then it becomes a conditioned space within the definition of the code. Wonderful. Thank you. Sorry for combining those two separate questions. I, we've gotten a ton of great questions. I wish we had time to get to them all. Um, but in the interest of time, we're going to move forward. So thank you again, Matt. Before we conclude, I do want to touch on a couple of things. A short survey, CEUs, and notification about upcoming webinars. We'd really appreciate receiving your feedback through the survey that you'll receive shortly. So please take a minute and fill that out. Also, don't forget to download the certificate of completion from the links in the follow-up email that will be sent to you after the webinar ends. And finally, make sure that you're signed up to receive our APA update newsletter so that you will be notified of our next webinar, as well as future webinars and updates to APA publications and standards. To receive it, all you need to do, starting from the homepage of our website, is click on Sign In in the upper right-hand corner of the web page. A menu will then drop down. Simply select Register. From there, you will need to let us know what you'd specifically like to receive, which in this case is the APA update newsletter. I should mention that if you have technical questions on any topic related to the use of engineered wood products, don't hesitate to contact the APA help desk at the address shown here. We also have APA field staff available to assist design professionals, builders, and code officials. Their individual contact information can be found on our APA website www.apawood.org. Please feel free to reach out and take advantage of this resource. As I mentioned earlier, a recording of today's webinar and answers to the questions that will be asked will be posted at apawood.org in a couple of weeks. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending. Have a great day.